You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible is Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. This week, Father Paul concludes his series on the itinerant word in Genesis chapters 1 through 11, noting the centrality of divine judgment and the folly of human ethics. I am happy to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. Let me add these extra notes so that my hearers would be reminded of Genesis 1 through 11. Number one, all humankind is subsumed in the repetitive Ha'adam, the human being, that pervades Genesis 1 through 11, no less than 36 times. This explains why we do not hear of an explanation sought by many a reader of Scripture as to where Cain's wife came from. Okay, Adam is the entirety of humanity. Number two, all the Bene Adam, the sons of the man, are already posited as being the environment in which we human beings all live. That is to say, already outside the garden, since. Adam knew Eve, his wife, after they were both sent forth from the garden and driven out of it. The multiplicity is linked to the humanity outside the garden. I refer you to my classic comment. We are not Adam. We've never been in paradise. We shall be in paradise towards the end in Ezekiel and Isaiah. We are posited as children of Adam, and the children of Adam appear in chapter 4 when Adam and his wife were outside the garden. So stop dreaming, especially the Christians, you know, and their theologians and their preachers. It is as though paradise is on Central Avenue down the street. I mean, this happens in uh, Disney World, but not in Scripture. Thirdly, after hearing a long list of names of specific individuals, Genesis 4 and 5, the story of the first universal punishment in chapter 6 has throughout Ha'adam as the main character besides God. You know it, I don't need to read it. You have only Ha'adam, the entire humanity is subsumed in Ha'adam. Let me read you just the beginning. When men, you see how English is misleading. You hear men, but in the Hebrew, you have ha'adam. So I'm going to read the English, but when I get to ha'adam, I'm going to read the Hebrew, because otherwise you have in English men or man. When ha'adam began to multiply on the face of the ground, the sons of God saw that the daughters of Ha'adam were fair. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in Ha'adam forever, and so on and so forth. And my fourth point, the nations mentioned in Genesis 10 are introduced as the Toledot, the worthies of Bene Noah. Noah, and Noah is the last descendant in the Toledot, the birthings of Adam. And started with that, we hear about the nations and the families. 
So it's very interesting that chapter 6, that is between chapter 5, where we have the genealogy between Adam and Noah, and chapter 10, where we have the sons of Noah as the heads of all nations, we have in chapter 6 the use just of Ha'adam to speak about the entire humanity. The centrality of the divine judgment in scripture is underscored very early on and several times in Genesis. The judgment that we hear of in Psalms 7 through 9 and 82, we have it very early and repeatedly in Genesis 1 through 11. We have it in chapter 3, the man and his wife. 4, Cain, 6 through 9, the entire creation. And in chapter 11, the entire humanity in conjunction with the Tower of Babel. So this, clearly, when you get to the book of Psalms, prepare for what we hear in the book of Psalms. And thus, again, we need to hear Psalm 8 and 82 in the light of Genesis 1 through 11, where the human being is never put on the same level as God. So, the conclusion is that when even the gods are not God in the same manner as the scriptural God is God, let alone the human beings. And I would like to quote you text, very, very low blow irony against the other gods, is that they do not make use of their senses. And on purpose, I'm using this word. You know how in English, you have to use sense to make sense. Well, in the Psalms, the gods do not do that. In Psalm 115, we hear, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to thy name, remember that name, give glory for the sake of thy steadfast love and thy faithfulness. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Very nice. I underscore this in my book. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. Recall Psalm 7, 8, 9. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear. And I like this, noses but do not smell. Remember how in Isaiah chapter 1, God smells our offering and doesn't like the smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them are like them, so are all who trust in them. And in 135, the idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. They have eyes, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. Like them be those who make them, yea, everyone who trusts in them. It is interesting that way before Isaiah, which is before Psalms, we have the smelling, which is very strange for us, that God smells. We have a reference to God smelling. So when you hear Isaiah later, you're not surprised that God does not like the smell of our offerings. Because earlier in Genesis 8, we hear that he liked the smell of the offering of Noah 
Let me read it to you. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing odor, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the imaginations of man's heart is evil from his youth, and so on. And here we have the generic man, men. And the walking is very well known that the others have feet but do not walk, but God walks and he walks intently. Remember what I said in the past podcast about the hitael of halak, the form hithalek or the pi'el, hilek, that he moves and he asks the people to walk the way he walks. And the most famous text is the earliest one among them, where we are told that Enoch walked Hithalek with God, exactly like God Hithalek walked in chapter 3. And I developed this in my book, The Rise of Scripture. So the conclusion is that at best, we human beings are like Elohim in the sense of the plural gods. Notice how intelligently the Septuagint followed the Vulgate translated Elohim into the plural angels at best. But that does not save us from being judged exactly like the other gods are judged. We in 789 and the gods in 789 and 82. So this is what I would say regarding this theosis equalization, the heavenly being that culminated. And remember, I mean, it's not only in the East. I mean, uh, the famous painting of Michelangelo is in the famous building, the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican, that is always mentioned as the apogee, the apex of painting, I mean, at least one of them. And then you have God, very interestingly, in the form of the human being. Notice how they look alike, and they touch one another with the fingers. I mean, this is ridiculous, but what can we do? This is where we are at, and all I'm asking my hearers to really be serious, it's high time, especially in these times we are living, to really hear scripture in the original so that our legs will not be pulled while we are supposed to be walking hitalek according to the will of God and not imagine, uh, and this is what theologians and their students in schools of theology imagine, that they are really walking according to the will of God. They sit behind their desk and they say, we are doing the will of God. There is only one person who sits on the throne. I don't know if he has a desk or not. Well, he doesn't need one because he knows everything already. And from his throne, he really laughs at all of us. And that is the opening of the book of Psalms. He laughs at us. And at the end of this psalm, he also judges all nations. So things are integrated, interrelated, and it's high time that we, especially we Orthodox, the others, you know, have their own problems. I'm not going to delve into them. They are not different than we are. But we especially like to underscore the word theosis. It is as though it's a word that reflects specifically orthodoxy. And we have other words like that we like to use, like vision and phronema other terminology. Anyway, that is my lengthy answer to your question, Father Mark. Just going back for a moment to Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, where 
the punishment for entering into this debate, this religious philosophical debate about ethics and morality, the punishment is death, and the way that you connect it to Psalm 82. Very clearly. I mean, you have the same uh, verb, even sound-wise, it sounds the same. Yeah, but this idea that in Psalm 82, the punishment also is death, or the threat of death, or harm judgment, because of the consequences of the behavior of the gods and siding with the wicked and so forth, there seems to be a connection with this religious discussion, this philosophical discussion about ethics and morality with false judgment. Hearing, again, this echoing in my ears, the punishment of death, it's hard not to also think of, for example, Deuteronomy, where we hear again and again about the punishment of death for disobedience. Could you say something about this interconnection with human judgment as it relates to what you've been saying about the death of the gods and so forth? Death is issued ultimately by the author of life, that is God. Let's jump. Matthew is the genesis of the New Testament. There is no judgment before the divine judgment. And very early in the book, do not judge lest he be judged. Okay, do not start emitting judgment. Remember that you yourself, the judge or the judging, the judger, is actually going to be judged. It's a literary way to say that judgment is reserved only to the one seated on the throne of judgment. And in scripture, as I always say, it's not that show me and where is it, but we have also nine justices and other judges. And so I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about scripture. Only the scriptural God judges. Not the human being, especially because even the gods that look like God more than human beings look like God are under judgment by God in Psalm 82 and also in Psalm 7, 8, 9. That is the point. That's why in Deuteronomy and previously in Leviticus, the good and the evil are defined by God, by the scriptural God, not by the gods like in ancient Greece. And this is something we'll never get out of it because we built our theology on the back of Plato and his followers. In the book of Deuteronomy, you don't have that. So even Moses does not judge. He recites Deuteronomy to threaten the people. And this is what I like about the text you refer to, Deuteronomy, because it's a repeat at its end of Leviticus, at its end where you have to choose between one of the two ways defined by God and only by Him. He alone is the knower of what He considers as good and of what He considers as evil. And this is something we circumvent when we say the good and the evil. You'll never find it like this in the Bible. It is always the elder who is teaching the younger the way of the good and the evil. He doesn't philosophize to you. Like Plato, first he has to convince them that what he considers good is actually good. In the Bible, you don't find that. The elder, and ultimately God, tells you, this, he almost points with his finger, is the good way, and this is the wrong way. We all know that the way, Derek, is a key word, not only in the Torah, but in the entire Bible and has nothing to do with you and me debating 
That's why, you know, I make fun of the subject ethics in schools of theology and philosophy and seminaries. What do you mean by ethics? You discuss with your teacher and he or she tries to convince you and you try to convince them and so on. No. And the word reason in English is a mistranslation. Let us reason. You have it early in Isaiah. The people can take it as a starting point. Okay, you see, God is reasoning with us. No, it is the verb judge. And it's very clear from Hosea. It is a situation where you are standing before the judgment seat. And again, and again, and again, so that's a preparation for my book. You're going to hear this unless some of us get serious and start hearing the original Hebrew consonantally. We are doomed. Theology is a big hoax. As is philosophy, obviously. But for me, there is no difference between them. I mean, take the word theology. You're speaking about God. Can you imagine? God is sitting on his throne and listening to what we're saying about him instead of regurgitating his words that we hear out of the mouth of Jeremiah, in whose mouth were gurgitated the words of God, which he regurgitated to us. It's high time, that's all I can say. You know. If I were lengthy in my answer, it's just I wanted to make sure that the hearers would not use your question as a license to go to the book of Deuteronomy to build up a new class in ethics, divine ethics or scriptural ethics. Technically, ethics is from the word ethos, which is a way of living. So if you go to the original languages, that's why I refer to them as much as I can in my book. But I use it in this way. If even Greek and Latin, the old Greek and the old Latin, behave in the same way as Hebrew, it doesn't mean that their writings say what scripture is saying, but at least the people were attuned in those times, then there is no hope for us. But uh, I count on God to keep us in some kind of hope, hoping that it would not be false. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network. 